Hello everybody. I don't think it is any exaggeration to say that when Aston Martin unleashed the V8 Vantage on the world back in 2005, they created an instant classic. That car was assured a place in the Aston Martin and indeed British car halls of fame the moment it was released. And the simple fact is that even a decade and a half later, that is still a car which can turn heads, including my own, and generate conversation wherever it goes. I do not envy the people that had the task of coming up with a replacement for such a car. However, I think it's fair to say they did rather balls it up a bit. You see, when the new Vantage was announced, everybody was aware of the fact that this was the most significant, the most important car in Aston Martin's new vision. The DB11 had done all right. I mean, it's not a car that seemed to get universal praise, but Eh, a few of them sold, I saw them about, they seemed to be doing okay. However, this was always going to be the one that was the volume seller. This was always the most important car for Aston to get right. And they just didn't. Why didn't they? Well, I think first off, I'm just not convinced that it's a looker. Every time I see one, it does grow on me just a little bit. But an Aston Martin should wow me the moment that I see it and then get better and better the more that I look at it. There are certain things that I really do like about this car. The creases on the edge are nice and sharp and they do look box fresh. And the proportions overall are pretty right as well. I think the biggest issue most people, including myself, had was with the front end. That great big huge grille looks like it should have come from perhaps a, a far sportier, more hardcore variant rather than the regular car. And the lack of any slats or things in it meant it looked just a bit odd. In fact, the whole front end is rather featureless. Those lights are apologetically small and there just doesn't need to be any detailing, nothing of interest, nothing to hold the eye. Now, Aston have actually introduced a, a new front end which you can have, which looks a little bit more traditional and I think it is a touch better. But overall, this I think is an awkward looking car. I'd love to know your opinion because of course, looks are always subjective. However, there were other things that were a little bit controversial too. The choice of the four liter twin turbo Mercedes engine as their new power plant didn't go down too well with a lot of people. Personally, I think that actually was an inspired choice. It's an excellent engine that has a great reputation. It makes the power. It also makes a great noise and why wouldn't you get an engine like that in your car if you could? It's, it's fantastic. Uh, here it produces only about 500 horsepower and I think that did leave quite a few people scratching their heads because Aston asked a lot of money for this car. In fact, spec one of these up even fairly modestly and you are facing down a bill of about £140,000, making it considerably more expensive than Porsche's then new 992. Now that engine is connected to an 8-speed ZF automatic gearbox, which to drive normally and gently like I am in the minute, is actually pretty good. I'm very impressed by how quickly it can change from drive into reverse, meaning that this is a, a nice car to move about in tight situations. It's got a 360 degree camera, which is very handy because visibility in this, like the old car, is somewhat limited. Interior. Let's talk about that, shall we? Because that's been the big sticking point, I think, for a lot of people with these cars. And it just simply isn't good enough. I actually think it is better than in the DBS that I drove recently. And that's wrong because the DBS is a lot more expensive. They've tried to tidy things up a little bit, but there's still just too many buttons here. They don't look or feel very special. And this last generation Mercedes infotainment is like some sort of ancient torture device. It is totally nonsensical, feels completely out of place, and frankly, I think makes a lot of people just get all whimsical about the old rubbish Volvo unit that you had 10 years ago. That at least could be made to go away so it didn't embarrass you in front of company. Now there are good things. The rest of it actually feels pretty nice. There's some cool shapes in here. Some very odd design choices like these sort of, I don't know, hammerhead shark inspired door pulls to get you out which aren't actually very intuitive to use because you have to kind of hook them like that. That's, that's a bit silly. I, I do like the sort of door pull here, very race car feeling. I don't like the fact that on the exterior, you have the exact same door handles that you had 15 years ago, which seems so odd when you've got to the extent of, you know, replacing the engine, the chassis, the infotainment, everything. The one part you leave on a car is the door handles. 
And let's face it, most people buying one of these cars, I think Aston would have expected to have owned an old car. And surely you're not gonna want the first thing people touch on their brand new car to be the same as their old one. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Seems unnecessarily lazy. Other odd and strange things Aston Martin have done with this car include the fact that they've given you nowhere to put the key. And the key itself is a bit cheap and nasty looking, really. It's all very unfortunate. I mean, look, I, I know the old emotional control unit was just a slightly cringeworthy piece of PR, but to hold, it was actually a very nice thing, so long as you didn't drop it, because they were ruddy expensive. And the theatre of putting it into the dash and all that jazz formed part of the experience. I was very happy that this car doesn't tell me it's got power, beauty, and soul when it turns on, because that was also absolutely tragic. But, you know, I, I can forgive Aston a few little oddities. I can't forgive them the fact that on this particular car, they seem to have built it in such a haste that the boot is so badly misaligned, it's tearing its own paint off. I mean, <sighs> Aston Martin, along with every other British car company, are always getting hounded for poor build quality issues, and you really would think they'd use this opportunity to kind of, you know, make a clean break with the past and just try and do things a little bit better. But they don't seem to have been too fussed about that. As a result of these issues and a few others, the Vantage simply hemorrhaged money. What started off as a 140, 150,000 pound car very quickly became a sort of 80 to 90,000 pound car. And Aston Martin unfortunately made a very very basic schoolboy error you see they weren't selling the things but they were still building them and so at Christmas last year Aston Martin decided they wanted to clear out the showrooms to pave the way for the incoming DBX and so they were doing deals on these where you could buy a new car or nearly new for £1,000 deposit £1,000 a month on a two-year lease deal they pay your servicing and they pay your first year's road tax now, I know to some people that will still sound like a lot of money, because it is. However, in the realms of this kind of car, that is pretty much giving them away. As a result, of course, they sold a whole bunch of them, so I expect you're probably going to be seeing quite a few of them on the roads for at least another couple of years. However, this did have the unintended consequence of knackering the values of all of the ones that were remaining. That means that this is now a very, very good time for me to visit this car. I wanted to say revisit there, but the fact is I've never actually sat behind the wheel of one of these until today. And when you're looking at a car that you know you can pick up for about 80 odd thousand pounds rather than 140, that rather changes things. And there is one big question that until now I haven't been able to answer because you will be able to tell from the internet whether you like the looks of it, whether you think the specs are good enough and all that jazz. But what I haven't been able to answer is, is it actually fun to drive? So let's find out, shall we? Because that is rather important in any car, especially an Aston Martin. Now it's not thunderously quick. It might sound amazing and put out some decent power and torque figures, but the fact is, this new car is a bit of a porker. Uh, like yours truly, it's perhaps not as lithe as it may appear. Aston claimed that this was a lighter car than the one that it replaced, but that was a fact achieved only through, well, I would say a downright lie, because what Aston started doing was quoting dry weights. A very Italian thing to do. And in fact, even the Italians don't quote dry weights for things like, say, the new Roma. They've been quoting curb weights recently, and they're getting pretty good at being honest with them too. However, this car is heavier than even the old V12. Don't know how they managed it, really, but somehow they did. Those clever Aston engineers. second gear pull, it'll writhe and squirm a little bit, like anything with 500 odd horsepower, 500 odd pound foot of torque and two-wheel drive should, but it never throws you to the horizon in the way you might hope that it does. That being said, 
This is not a slow car, not by any stretch of the imagination, and it does make a good sound in the process. It sounds different enough from the AMG GT and other Mercedes products that have this engine to be distinct, I would say. The gearbox similarly, I mean I'm driving this car currently in all of its comfier settings, so that's sport for both suspension and drivetrain, and I would say actually the gearbox is perfectly competent. A lot of people I know say that Aston really should have put a dual clutch in this and that's why they didn't sell very many, but I have to say this 8-speeder is a great unit. I'm going to stick it into Sport Plus and see what she does. Oh yes, changes are really quick. I mean I would genuinely say pretty much dual clutch fast on the upshift and down if I'm fair. There's nothing wrong with this powertrain and you can get into a groove. Now it's a little bit softer than the DBS. Actually no, scratch that. It's a lot softer than the DBS. And what I've got to say, it is nice to drive. I mean, genuinely, really, I know this car is a big old boat. Well, by mass anyway, if not dimensions. And yet it's still a lot of fun to pedal. Steering is really genuinely very good. Perhaps not quite as communicative and textured as the old units, but it's perfectly weighted. I have to say I found the steering in the DBS really very good, and I prefer this steering over that of pretty much any current Ferrari. The Roma is very nice, but just a little bit too light and, and a little bit too aggressive on the turn-in. And I am someone that does like a quick turn-in, but the Ferrari units are perhaps a, a touch too high hyperactive. This is absolutely spot on. As you'd expect it's got plenty of torque and this engine is also pretty good on the turbo lag front. It's not completely devoid of it but unless you're mashing the pedal, which you shouldn't be doing in a car with this amount of power, it's pretty good, pretty predictable, very linear. Why Aston didn't give it more power I don't know but honestly right here, right now, I'm not complaining. The truth is that I really have never liked the new 992 and it's a car that's flawed in so many ways which means that for once Porsche is actually pretty vulnerable. Now the Aston is equally flawed but it counters by being that much more special if by virtue of rarity and, and nothing else. It's also reasonably practical. The boot in here is actually a pretty good size by Aston standards. The infotainment will eventually work if you read the sort of, you know, 5,000 page encyclopedia on how to get it to do its thing, but it, it, it can be done. All right, the interior here is a bit silly. I'm not a fan of this particular car's color scheme. However, one of the good things about Aston Martin is that pretty much whatever you want, they will do. Whatever colour you want this car in, whatever colour you want the interior in, they can do it. There's some odd details on this particular car, being Marek Reichmann, their global head of design's own personal vehicle. He went for the mashed carbon badges, which I don't really like, I think they look a little bit silly. But, you know, people go for that sort of thing, and Aston were trying to go for new stuff with this car, and why not? is rude. Now this car's very kind owner Jim previously had a McLaren 570S which he had for about a year, rather enjoyed, it never broke down on him. Unfortunately it all started to fall apart, I mean quite literally it was corroding on him and sort of fell out of love with it. He then went to a 911 Turbo S 991 and found that that was an extraordinarily competent yet equally dull car. So when looking for this car, he went out searching for something that was rear-wheel drive, had a great soundtrack, most importantly was exciting to drive. And I have to say, I think he made the right choice with this one. It actually is an enjoyable car. I'd hoped that it would be. I mean, this car is the first one that Matt Becker had a proper hand in. Matt Becker being a former Lotus vehicle dynamics guy that Lotus foolishly lost and Aston wisely pinched. And this is the first vehicle that he really had a hand in from the ground up. The DB11, he came in a bit too late in the process. And I have to say, you can feel the hand of Matt in this car because it really is very well damped. I mean, how they've managed to make a big old bus like this enjoyable, exciting, engaging. I don't know, but they did it. 
And so actually, I think with the right spec and at the right price, the Vantage is a car I would consider as a daily driver that's a bit fun, a bit different, and just far more exciting and interesting than a 911. It's a decent steer. Brakes are pretty good too. Plenty of poke. It is a decent package. I wish they'd sort this out, and I hope maybe that in the next couple of years they'll be able to have a thorough redesign and, and, and sort all of that. But if you can live with that, and at £140,000 I probably couldn't, but at £80,000 I might find some forgiveness in my heart, Vantage is all right. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.